Welcome to In The Zone. I am Janjo, and my guest today is the most serious duelist. How are you doing? Oh, uh, I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me, Janjo. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Now, for those who don't know, uh, the most serious duelist, he went viral, uh, was about 11 years ago at this point, I want to say, uh, millions of views with some 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 funny stuff i'm sure i'll i'll show as i'm talking here which is uh, you know is a good reason for any to be on this podcast not anyone really needs a a big reason but hey it's better reason than any so for this interview i have the titanic 10 these are 10 questions i have formulated should be a manageable amount i think so are you ready to tackle tackle these well let's do it all right so first question i have and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering about this. What was the story behind the most serious duelist ever? Well, you see, at that time, the game had gotten, well, shall we say, pricey. I mean, it's never been a cheap game to play. But when you had, I believe, Pot of Duality was a staple at the time, and that was like a hundred bucks each. And decks were doing some incredibly powerful combos for the time, and normal tactics of normal summon a monster, maybe special summon one or two, wasn't cutting it. So I pretty much just one night said, screw it, what is the cheapest way to win a game? And we got to Exodia. And I said, <laughs> as a contrarian, went, nah, we're not going to Exodia. How can I have fewer brick cards in my deck? And I went, what's this trap card that does damage? And then I found Blasting the Ruins and went, hmm. So that does 9,000 hmm. and everything kind of spiraled into or out of control. And I took it to a locals tournament and it performed better than it had any right to do. Oh, man. Are, are, are we talking top cut? Uh, I made it to the finals and uh, the top eight and got seventh. A uh, fish deck popped off, and I just went, you know what? This is life. Life happens. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty good. Bring a deck that you thought was going to be really bad, and next thing you know, top eight. I mean, I think there was only 30 people there, but still. I mean, that's still a, a high amount, um, I, I would say. Was, was that a deck that you, after that, you're like, all right, let me let me try this out some more, or was it a one-and-done type of deal? It was supposed to be a one-and-done type of deal because, you know, once you reveal the secret, there's so much counterplay to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Then the video happened. <laughs> so uh, that actually leads me to my second question here. What were your thoughts on the video just blowing up on the internet, especially in such a relatively early time for YouTube? I think first thoughts were, that's kind of cool. Second thoughts were, Ha, huh, that's a lot of people who now know who I am. And third thought was, oh, man, I, I may, maybe should have asked to um, upload it on my own channel. <laughs> you could have got all that sweet ad revenue. Was that something you felt like you needed to capitalize on or something you just saw and thought, OK, that's, you know, it's it's fun, but I'm just going to continue doing my own thing. For a moment, I did, but and it boils down to it. We're never really as clever as we think we are, and I couldn't really come up with any other ideas. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of petered out. For you, as one of the more uh, one of those more like natural happening moments. It's kind of hard to like recreate it type of deals. Hmm. People can tell when you're being genuine and when you're not, and it felt like I was forcing it after a while. Okay. This leads me to my third question: Did it change your perspective or how you approach Yu-Gi-Oh at all with all this bombastic play style? No, I've always been a had a bombastic play style. I've been playing this game since the Bondi games. I've always been bombastic while playing. Oh, since the the, the, the Bondi more... games, huh? I used to have my old deck, but I have no idea where that went. But yeah, I've always been highly energetic and bombastic while playing. It's half the fun of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, these are just leading to my questions here. Uh, for um, is, is there a level of fun that every player should have? Or is there like a time and place for the like more out there playing? Well, here's the thing. Everyone who plays this game deserves to have fun in a way they have fun. And 
And as you said, there's a time and place for everything. If I enter a big tournament like a regionals or a nationals, then I need to draw back the bombasticness to some degree because people are there to be more serious with the game. Uh, pun intended, I suppose. <laughs> and listen, the, after all the hard work that people put into researching decks, the last thing you need is someone yelling, and I summon Claudians and attack directly! <laughs> you know, because there's a time mm. and a place. However, that same serious nature shouldn't lead over to a casual environment where a more bombastic attitude should be more accepted. Yeah, there's definitely two types so, of, of, of series with, with this. It's kind of interesting to look at. Mm. <laughs> Question five, like, where do you find enjoyment in Yu-Gi-Oh! Is it from the, the the type of dueling that we've seen from those videos, or is there some some other element uh, regarding Yu-Gi-Oh? Sometimes it's the energy of the room just to play the game, but mostly it's I like to actually play a game. And I we're gonna bring up modern Yu-Gi-Oh for a moment. My comparisons have been modern Yu-Gi-Oh is incredibly skillful, incredibly intensive knowledge base. You need to know ex all of your interactions to play it well. But the game tends to fire off and end within the first three to five turns a lot of the time. And that feels more like a gunfight. Whereas I prefer the long drawn out games where you could top deck an answer. You see that your opponent has game, but you have five turns to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And if you do do something about it, they're on the back foot. More like a sword duel. And I have more fun with that engagement. Personally, that doesn't mean that the game is better that way or in any way shape or form it mm -hmm. that's where i have more fun with it does that mean you're more into like controlled stun decks not necessarily though i do enjoy those one of my decks used to be a gravity bind deck as long as a deck feels like i'm going to fire my biggest combo at your biggest combo and we'll see mm -hmm. who comes out on top versus I'm going to shut down everything you do, and you're going to try to shut down everything I do. So one of us, only one of us, plays the game. Okay. I don't suppose if that makes any sense or not. No, that, that makes sense. You rather have uh, you know an interactive game than uh, someone playing so solitaire with themselves. I, I suppose unless it's Exodia and or blasting the ruins. And I had built those because I was upset with the current state of the game, honestly. Which, which is funny because uh, recently at this recent uh, YCS, there was an Exodia deck that everyone was really rooting for. Like, that deck seems to come up now and again, whether it's, like, at major events like a YCS or even at, at Worlds as it did, what, like, 2018, 2016, somewhere around then? From experience, they're a fun deck to build, and you gotta know your odds and numbers every time you draw a card to really play it efficiently, so it's also very skill-intensive even if it doesn't seem that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I take it you're a, you're a fan of Mystic Mine. I'm a mixed fan of mixed, Mystic Mine. Because the counterplay to Mystic Mine at the time would get stomped by anything else in the meta that wasn't Mystic Mine. But, and the card is a concept I have very little problem with, because I thought, okay, it's going to force people to actually run more spell and trap removal in the proper things, because most people tend to be focusing on their monster effects more than their spell or trap cards. I mean, we're in a stage where Change of Heart came back, and I don't think anyone particularly runs it as a, yes, this has to be in a deck sort of thing, you know? Yeah, definitely saw some testing early on, but definitely fell off, um, you know, not in the same regards as, like, a Called by the Grave. And even kind of like Upsar Gob is kind of in, in the same vein, too. Or uh, like Harpy's Feather Duster, but but you're right in in the in the sense that Mystic Mind really checked people's more well-rounded deck building than pure combo builds. I think Mystic Mind is really a fascinating uh, like litmus test for for people who enjoy Yu-Gi-Oh or or uh, maybe enjoy it at a more uh, masochist level. Now, personally, I've always been uh, on the mind that I think it's fine at one. But I can absolutely agree with people that think that it should be banned for life. It's just is one of those, one of the most divisive cards in the game. But that's what makes it uh, rather interesting. Um, I know a lot of people weren't the biggest fan of stuff like Mystic Mine. And uh, re regarding that, it leads me to my next question. So, what was it that made you disassociate yourself from Yu-Gi-Oh for a time? Was it the expensive cards? Was it the the way the game was changing? Can you elaborate on that? It's a combination of all of it. 
um, I've been playing the game a long time, and as you get older, it's harder to change up how you do things. Also, cards are expensive. That's just the that's just the fact of it. And when I'm looking at these are the staples you need to have any chance in a competitive game and price tags like a hundred and fifty dollars and that's just for those staples. I it kinda lose mm -hmm. me a little bit personally. Plus I actually had a meta Yang Zing deck for exactly one week, played it, won a bunch of games, immediately sold it because I was so bored with it. And it just wasn't mm. fun to me. Do you think that was a case of just picking the wrong deck? Like, w would there have been another deck that perhaps maybe in retrospect, you're like, oh, that, that one actually is kind of fun. I have had fun with approximately, oh boy, let's see here. I had fun with sprites in theory. I never actually built that out. And I had fun with Sky Striker, but I think those are the only two meta decks I actually enjoyed playing. Okay, are we talking like early Sky Strikers or like recent Sky Strikers? Before Ma the uh, Maven's box dropped, that's okay. about when I was building Sky Strikers. Yeah, the, the Maven's box, that was a whole dropping a bomb Ooh, well, on yeah. its own <laughs> with all the Ishizu cards and creating that whole Ishizu tier limit meta that uh, a lot of people weren't necessarily uh, fans of. And I can understand why it completely circumvented the game, and suddenly you're playing a completely different game. I guess you could say it's a struggle of playing current TCGs, or, you know, contemporary current, is that you could spend all this money on a deck, and all of a sudden, a, a new set could completely outpower creep it. A new list can drop, getting banning or limiting or just completely butchering this deck it, it, it's can be, it can be really heartbreaking at times especially if you put in a lot of time and money into playing the game oh yes so an ever-shifting meta can be very healthy for a tcg yes uh like you mentioned with sky striker i mean that deck was around that was in the tier one for such a long time every time konami would try and hit something from that deck it just kept going and it kept going so I've I've heard that you've actually played other uh, trading card games. Is is this correct? That is correct. Yes. Uh, what what other uh, card games have you played? Well, back in um, the day, there was this Christian card game called Revolution. No, I'm just kidding. I never played that <laughs> game. I found it one day and was and was very confused by it. Actually, the game I started at was Magic: The Gathering. Shocker! Okay. I know. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with that game. And then I just started running out of people to play with and shifted to Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm -hmm. And then after getting really irritated with Yu-Gi-Oh, I shifted to Cardfight Vanguard. Okay. A game that's had two reboots and is still trying to figure out what to do. It's quite sad for that game, even though I enjoy its core system where you can be very good at the game. But because there's a heavy luck base in it, you're never fully out of the game. Comes down to heart of the cards? Oh, yes. Quite literally, sometimes. <laughs> so, this leads me to question seven. Uh, so, what is it about other card games that you prefer over Yu-Gi-Oh? Like, what do they offer that Yu-Gi-Oh does not? To me, Magic, when I played it, used to offer mass interaction because with limited resources... If I played my cards right, eh, pun intended, I suppose, um, I could outplay your counterplay because you only had so many resources to stop what I was doing. That doesn't, mm -hmm. That's not to say there weren't meta decks, but it felt more interactive. In Magic, I entered a um, Friday Night Magic tournament with a door to nothing this deck, a horrible strategy, and walked away with third place. It's the equivalent of walking into a tournament today with Gate Guardian and um, getting your Nationals invite. <laughs> Not impossible, but some people would raise some eyebrows. And with Vanguard, since there's very limited things you can do on your opponent's turn, when it's your turn, for the most part, you're safe. You can do your combos. It's your mm -hmm. combo clashing against their combo. It's just a question of whether or not some combos get out of hand, and that's something else to talk about. But you never feel like, oh, my turn? Passed. Couldn't do anything. You have too many negates. Oh, you hammered on me. My turn? Passed. Oh, you had too many negates. I couldn't do anything. So it's it's the case of, of interactability with that it requires a certain skill level to win 
certain games while still having that like you're not interacting during your opponent's turn to a heavy degree where it is essentially it's our turn type of deal it's a good way of putting it yes it's like if i sit down to play a game with someone i'm sitting down to have a game with them why would i want to stop them from having a game with me if it's not Mm -hmm. a tournament where i'm here to win some people find enjoyment in pulling out their crazy combos and establishing this insane board but there's there's definitely uh an issue with that with being too much with going overboard on that mentality which a lot of people have issues with the way Yu-Gi-Oh tends to go in a lot of of its formats uh, yeah again everyone has to have fun in this game in the way they see fit but as I'll draw back from earlier there's a time and a place for everything yeah you definitely need a game with variety in it with the kinds of play styles that fit different people while not having one be too powerful. And that's where people enjoy a lot of these time wizard, these alternate formats like Tangu plant or Edison or goat, because they have these more interactive play styles that do have their crazy decks, but it's not overblown. I'll even say it. Those aren't necessarily the superior way to play the game objectively either. Because everyone has their own objective view on how they have fun with the game. And as you mentioned, some people Mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoy pulling out their crazy combos and then winning by chokehold. And that's completely valid. I'm not allowed to say you can't have fun like that, but I am allowed to say I'm not having fun playing against that. Oh, that's that's totally fair. Speaking of go, I heard that. You sort of came back into, like, the GOAT format, period. My buddy that uh, contacted you used to go by Evil Midget. I'm not 100% what, he's, what um, name he's landed on these days ever since the Dungeon Dice success, but he built me a GOAT format based off a deck I built in my later days of Yu-Gi-Oh!, which I called Labrador. The joke, of course, being there is everything that belongs to you belongs to the Labrador. Everything that belongs to the Labrador belongs to the Labrador. It was a I steal your entire board deck. It ran things like Jowls of Dark Demise, Reflegia Seduction, Creature Swap, stuff like that. <laughs> it sounds like a very schoolyard deck. <laughs> oh, that deck was um was actually inspired by and I hate to say it, an old um episode of Hercules where they were asking Hercules, Why don't you carry a sword? And then they get attacked and he punches someone and he goes, Why would I carry a sword when they can carry it for me? <laughs> I mean that's that's better inspiration for a deck than any. I mean, especially in uh yeah. you know the game of Yu-Gi-Oh where a lot of decks kind of, you know, the cream rises to the top in a lot of regards and it's nice to still see some fun decks whether it is you know like roguish ingenuity. So, this leads me to question 8. So, what is it about older yep. formats like Goat format um that kind of pulled you back into playing it? Is it just like the nostalgia? Is it the way it plays? Is it just doing it just because no. it's kind of just to play it? It's a plethora of things. One, it's a play style that I enjoy more. Two, the no- it's definitely nostalgia definitely has a play as a part in it. Nostalgia always often and always does. Again, my buddy decided to literally build me a deck, and I'm like, well, if you're literally gonna hand me the weapon, I might as well play it, you know? I've been able to recapture some of the old fun I've had like ten years ago with the game, and that was nice. So with that said, uh, question number nine, what should Yu-Gi-Oh! change to improve itself, in in your opinion? And you see, if I had the proper answer to that, I'd be a much richer and wiser man. <laughs> but a few things that need to happen. Number one, trap cards need to go back to being trap cards, not spell cards you set on the field and then activate a turn later. A trap, a face-down card should always make you scratch your head. It's like, if I do something, is that card going to punish me? As opposed to, oh, um... Past turn, start of your turn, activate this to search my deck to further my combo. Two, something needs to be done to lower the necessity of hand traps. I have no idea what the answer to that is. But you shouldn't need to run hand traps like Impermanence and Ash Blossom to stand a chance. Those should be choices you make to further your own strategy, not, oh, you don't have any hand traps? Get ready to lose most of your games. And three, something needs to be done about the amount of monsters you can summon in a turn. It's starting to get a little ridiculous. 
Yeah, people have speculated, uh, you know, throughout the years of potentially there being a like a special summoning cap during the turns. But then that also kills like certain decks that do kind of do more spammy stuff like like your synchro decks or like pendulum decks. True, but we've killed those decks before with ban lists. This is true. And we've also killed pendulum decks with the last master rule. Everything had to be summoned off of link monsters and link arrows. Yes, those some of those spammy decks would die, and in my opinion, maybe some of them should. <laughs> I do think Level Eater is absurd as a card. <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree with what, what you say with a lot of those aspects, you know, like trap cards. Uh, typically, when you see modern decks, it's either, it's either a negate, like Infinite Permanence or uh, Solemn cards, or it is... A floodgate card, you know, like summon limit. There can be only one. Goes and match. Rivalry of warlords. And if they they do have archetypal specific traps, you typically only see one, maybe two copies of a card in a deck, and that's it. Yeah, because why run mirror force when you can run s solemn judgment and stop the thing that you would have mirror forced in the first place? Well, I was gonna say it says something when Konami releases a card like mirror force launcher. That sounds crazy. If it was 15 years ago, now you look at it and you're like, that card sucks. And so many problems could be answered with a single Mystical Space Typhoon, but I don't think anyone runs MST anymore. Yeah, I don't think so. But in that regard, uh, when Mystic Mind was coming more of an issue, you did see players run different back or removal like Twin Twisters or, or Galaxy Cyclone or Cosmic Cyclone. These, you know, MSC adjacent removal cards. And you kind of see them more in the in the side deck now, maybe like a Harpy's Feather Duster. But yeah, it's... I just think it's wild that Harpy's Feather Duster is not considered a main deck card for some decks. Yeah, I, I love main decking it personally, but I guess it just depends on, on the meta. And a lot of the times, yeah, you need to get those combo pieces. You need to have those negates. You need to have those hand traps, which... Called by the Grave tried to answer that, but then they limited Called by the Grave. So <laughs> it's it's a really uh, different time for Yu-Gi-Oh than than it has been within the last you know five years or so. Oh, final rule that everyone disagrees with, but I'll die on this hill: ban every other pot card, bring Pot Agreed back to one, and stop printing pot cards. <laughs> I, I think the problem is that they don't want to bring back Pot Agreed, so they're forced to keep printing these pot cards to circumvent around the issue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Ban all other pot cards, bring back Pot Agreed, and leave it. It'll never happen. I am objectively wrong in this, but I will die on this hill. So why, why do you want to bring Pot of Greed back compared to its contemporaries that have a similar draw function but with more downsides? Because their contemporaries, one, are more advantageous in some decks than others. Two, because you can normally run multiple copies of them, they are far more consistent than a single Pot of Greed. And the argument against Pot of Greed is, well, every deck will definitely run that as an insta one of. Mm -hmm. While this being true... Any deck that can run multiple copies of the current pop cards will instantly run multiple copies of the current pot cards. That is a fair point. But I, I think yeah, the issue is that is it. that Pot Agreed doesn't have any drawbacks, at least with you know, the arguments with something like Pot of Desires, is that, hey, you're going to banish a ton of random cards from your deck, or Pot of Prosperity is like, yeah, you got to choose some cards to, to banish. And then even if someone, let's say, like Joel and Lockbirds or Ash Blossoms, your pot card... Then all of a sudden you lose all these additional resources that you can't really get back typically. Oh, true enough. True enough. The drawbacks do exist. But more likely than not, when you've played one of those, you've unbricked your hand and you're going to play your powerful combo. Mm -hmm. So I prefer a world where, okay, I activate Pot of Greed with no, um, with no consequences. I negate your Pot of Greed. Well, guess I can't draw into another pot to try to solve this problem. That would be an interesting test. Get rid of all the pot cards and add one pot agree and see what players can do with that. I think I think that would be interesting. I, I would I, I enjoy the the chaos some some lists create. And that would absolutely create one. I don't think anyone would ever expect all of a sudden pot agreed to limited. 
Hey, if that happens, we're crediting this podcast. That, that we blame this podcast is what we do. <laughs> oh no! Right before Yanagarasu came uh, was unbanned, I I did a video talking about why it should be unbanned. So maybe who's to say? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this leads us to our last question, and this is kind of a nice cool down one. What to you is Yu-Gi-Oh all about? Frankly, much like any other game, it's oh boy. How do I put this without sounding cheesy or corny? Mm. <laughs> eh, considering who I am, screw it. I'm going to sound cheesy and corny. It lets people who may not be good at other things. Card games tend to be a very narrow niche on who's good at them. And maybe they're not necessarily as good at other things. It gives people a place to be in existence. Yu-Gi-Oh! was one of those things for me. More so than Magic the Gathering was. It built a good community... It with the anime and manga, it brought in more people, and it felt like a nice, safe place to have fun. And yeah, there were pricks. I used to be a prick when I was younger when I played this game, but it never felt nearly as malicious as some of the other card games, and it just felt like a good community to be a part of, you know? Mm -hmm. It was very important to me because one, it was one of the few things that I was good at, and two, let me let me meet a bunch of amazing people, and only a ha and I remember the negatives more than the positives because that's how we roll as human beings. But I can count my negatives on two hands, and good luck counting the amount of positive experiences I had, because those are countless. Even at this day, for every oh you've set up a full negate board and I can't play experiences, I've had a a slug out game for twenty turns while someone tries to figure out how to climb um. Cloudy and Sheep Cloud and Spirit Barrier. It was, you know, mm -hmm. there's so many different things that can happen in Yu-Gi-Oh! So much fun that can be had. So it's overall one of the better card game communities, in my opinion. And that's what Yu-Gi-Oh! is to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. I mean, it's hard to say it better myself. You know, all about, like, the positivity and uniqueness that comes with the game. And that really was what Yu-Gi-Oh! was created on, was just this sense of community driven by games i mean like not even just the like, card game but like the kazuki takahashi's like original work so i think that's like a, a phenomenal answer so yeah thank you for being on this podcast there's any last statements you want to make anyone a shout out just anything you want to get off your chest any confessions <laughs> You see, once upon a time, back when I was a blackjack dealer, I learned how to stack a deck. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Being completely serious, though, um, I guess I'll shout out my own channel, uh, MS Duelist. I, I do live streams. So I'm trying to become more active. Check out my buddy Mark, original um, name Evil Evil Midget. I really wish I had checked with him to see what he's going by these days. He's working very hard at bringing back Dungeon Dice Monsters and has some had some success on it. His Discord and, name is know, DM Devlin. Yeah, that's is that what he landed on? Right. Okay. That's way better than some of the other stuff <laughs> we brainstormed. Yeah, go check him out though. His passion for this game is much higher than even mine, and he deserves every bit of support that he can get. All right, yeah, thank you for being on this podcast. We had some highs, we had some lows, but hopefully we all had a little fun. That's the whole point of all of this, ain't it? Thank you very much for having me. It's been an honor. All right. All right. Thank you very much.